Hello there, my RPG lovers, and welcome to another video. Gothic 3 Forsaken Gods was a standalone game that continues the story of Gothic 3. If you watch my videos, you probably know how much I love Gothic 3, and yet you never heard me talk about Forsaken Gods, for a good reason. Even though Forsaken Gods was an official expansion, it was not developed by the studio that brought us the Gothic trilogy. Piranha Bytes, the original studio behind Gothic Trilogy, lost the license for Gothic IP, but only temporarily. The publisher Joe Wood acquired the license, and they hired different studios to develop Forsaken Gods and Arcania. I recently did a full retrospective video about Arcania, so you can check that out if you missed it. To put it simply, Arcania was a pretty bad game, but I think Forsaken Gods is way worse. Meow! Good day! First of all, this game was literally unplayable for a long time because of the game breaking bugs. It was even worse than Gothic 3 on release, which is impressive, in the worst way possible. I remember when my cousin bought me this game back in the day and I was really excited to play it. Back then I had no idea about who developed the game or anything like that, I was just getting into RPGs in general. Needless to say how disappointed I was, not because the game was bad, but because I couldn't even play it properly. Nowadays, the only thing you need to know about the technical state of the game is that it's playable. Hooray! Some parts of me wish that those technical issues never got resolved, because I wouldn't get to see how horrible the game is. Anyway, the enhanced edition is almost completely bug free, I managed to complete the game with no major issues. However, the performance of the game is still really bad. No matter how strong your PC is, you will have a lot of stutters while exploring the world, and noticeably lower FPS in big cities. It was very unpleasant to experience this again because the base game of Gothic 3 is not suffering from these issues anymore. Gothic 3 engine was incomplete because the game came out a lot earlier than it should. Ironically, Joe Wood is the one to blame for this because they pushed Piranha Bytes to release the game early. And shortly after that, Joe Wood published Forsaken Gods, which suffered from the same and even a lot worse technical issues. In the meantime, Gothic 3 received a lot of community patches that greatly increased the performance and fixed all the bugs. But only recently we got Parallel Universe patch, which basically fixed 99% of performance issues in Gothic 3. Short loading times, no freezes, and most importantly, no stutters. Unfortunately, even though Forsaken Gods runs on the same engine, this patch is not compatible with the game, so you're going to have a very choppy experience. That being said, I think we should finally start talking about the game. Oh boy. The world is free and belongs to us birds! <laughs> but before that, a quick word from today's sponsor. Yahaha Studio is a brand new, user-generated content creation platform for 3D multiplayer interactive experience. This platform allows you to easily create virtual experiences and the best part about it, you don't even need any coding experience or server knowledge. You can simply use one of the available templates, components and smart assets in Yahaha Studio to make your dream game. Yahaha provides you with millions of 3D assets that are instantly ready to use, along with the possibility to monetize your content. The process of making your content is pretty easy, it's really fun when you get to the stage where you get to playtest what you just made. How about a little game of hide and seek or prop hunt? I really want to turn into a lamp, but I first need to add the asset to the templates. You can see how easy it is to add assets to the template and use it in the playtest modes. It's just a couple of clicks basically. And just like that it's done and we can test it out in the playtest modes. <laughs> yep, this is my life now I guess. Use the link in the description to download Yahaha Studio for free and start your exciting journey as a game developer. Forsaken Gods actually had a pretty decent premise. The intro cutscene is basically just a slideshow, but it gives you enough info about the state of the world. Forsaken Gods is set only two years after the happenings of the first game. A couple of well-known characters you met in Gothic 3 and previous Gothic games have divided the land of Murtana into four pieces. The narrator from the intro labels them as factions, which is kinda misleading. The land has split. Four factions emerging within the territory. Each bent on rebuilding what was lost and making best with what little remains. That part of the intro got me really excited when I first played the game. I was convinced that Forsaken Gods will continue the same philosophy about the faction slash reputation system, especially after this quote from the intro. But much to my disappointment, that was not the case. We'll talk more about that in the gameplay section. Even though Gothic 3 had multiple endings, Forsaken Gods took only one of them as Canyon. 
the nameless hero and Zardas are in a different dimension where they observe the people from Ortana. Oh yeah, this game totally disregards other two major zones that were present in the base game. The mountains of Normar and the deserts of Varant are not accessible in this expansion. That would be completely fine by me if they actually explained it better or at least acknowledge it at some point. The intro cutscene doesn't even mention these huge zones, which played a major part in Gothic 3 story and gameplay. I mean the land of Mortana is big enough for a standalone game, there is no doubt about that. But it turns out that even this zone was way too ambitious for this expansion. Every major city has only a handful of NPCs that you can interact with and the open areas are almost totally devoid of any human NPCs. Anyway, while observing the people from Mortana, Zardas and the hero had a huge disagreement that led to a fight. The nameless hero lost and he goes back to the land of Mortana to try and unite the people once and for all. The fight between Zardas and the hero was just an excuse to make the hero weak again because he would go back to Mortana regardless. Speaking about the hero, his personality has drastically changed, which is noticeable even in the beginning cutscene. In previous Gothic games, including Gothic 3, the playable character known as the Nameless Hero was always portrayed as a neutral character. The players had the option to shape the outcome of the story by joining different factions, which heavily affected the gameplay in general. If you say so. Forsaken Gods went in a totally different direction. The main story is almost completely linear and this time around the Nameless Hero has very defined character traits. He comes off as a stereotypical hero in basically all dialogue scenarios. This gets annoying really fast and the over-exaggerated voice acting doesn't help at all. Waiting idle while the world digs its own grave is not an option. Listen to me, Anag. Give me your support to reunite Mertana. Help me bring back peace. When you want to make a more linear storyline, it makes sense to give more personality to the main character, right? But they created an extremely generic, egocentric hero that tries to act righteous in all dialogue lines. You'll do well to watch your tongue in my presence. I think they accidentally made a decent parody of a generic RPG hero, especially because of that cringy voice acting. It's very bad. Listen, listen, friend. Hold on a minute. Do you think I can help in any way? The original voice actor for Gothic 3 wasn't amazing by any means, but it was better than this. If you say so. So anyway, after the intro cutscene, you suddenly wake up at Silden, which is one of the major locations in Mortana. Enog is the leader of the city and you have a lengthy chat with him about the current political situation. Now, if you played Gothic 3, you probably remember this guy and his brother Enog as well. They were the rebels that you could join if you wanted to liberate Silden from the orcs. The leaders of other cities in Mortana are even more familiar if you played Gothic games. We have Taurus, Lee and Gorn. Look, all you need to know about the main story is that Gata and Trellis are at war. The rest of the factions are neutral and they feel extremely underdeveloped. As a matter of fact, the whole game feels underdeveloped in a lot of ways. Your main quest is to reunite Murtana, so you'll need to talk with all these major characters and possibly stop the war. However, you have to do a lot of quests before you can even meet some of these important characters and continue the story. I wouldn't have a lot of problems with this if the quests were actually well written and fun to do. Look, there is no reason to talk around this, the quest design is just terrible. So it's exactly like Gothic 3 quests, right? I can already see some people typing that in the comments. Nope, it's way worse. First of all, even though I love Gothic 3, one of my major criticisms was about the main story and underwhelming quests. The game felt really unfinished in those areas and compared to previous Gothic games, the main story and the writing were pretty bad. But if you ask me, the biggest redeeming factor when it comes to quests was the reputation system as well as a true sandbox gameplay which gives Gothic 3 an extremely high replay value. You had a lot of different ways to play the game and each new playthrough can be very different. Combined with the amazing open world with no load screens and equally amazing music, the game managed to create an unmatched immersive atmosphere. Sure, that doesn't justify the weak main story and some brain dead fetch quest in that game, I never claimed otherwise. But even compared to Gothic's 3 lackluster story and quests, Forsaken God somehow managed to be even worse when it comes to this. A lot worse. Everything feels like it was done by a studio who doesn't know what the hell they are doing. The first major task you get is to collect 5 letters of recommendation for Enoch. Like I said, Gothic 3 had a lot of simple fetch and kill quests, but almost each of them increased your reputation with some of the factions. Not to mention that all of them made some actual sense within the game world, despite the mediocre writing. 
From the very beginning of Forsaken Gods, you're probably going to notice how bad the quest design is. It's not even about bad writing and voice acting, even though that by itself can be enough to ruin your experience. To give you an example, the majority of quests in the game require going back and forth multiple times during a single quest. Maybe that doesn't sound so bad until you actually see how it works, so take a look at this. The gate guard Theodore gives you a quest to find a couple of his missing paladin scouts that were captured by the orcs. I already met these paladins before, so I knew their exact location, it's very close to Cape Dan. So you make your way to Cape Dan by foot or teleport if you have the teleportation stone. You have to talk with this orc who is apparently keeping these paladins as prisoners somehow, even though it seems like they could easily overpower him. I mean, it's just one orc and he looks like a regular scout. But anyway, he just confirms what you knew all along. Yes, indeed, he's keeping these paladins as prisoners and there are no more dialogue options. You have to go back to Theodore in Vanguard and speak with him again and the game doesn't tell you this. When you come back, Theodore tells you that you absolutely need to bring those scouts back but without violence. So yeah, you have to go back and speak with the orc again, big fucking surprise. You somehow convince him to take the paladins with you and now you have to bring them back to Vanguard. The NPC pet finding in this game is pretty bad, so you have to babysit the followers. This was improved quite a bit in Gothic 3 with community patches, but I'm not so sure about Forsaken Gods, because it seems a lot worse. You'll find a lot more quests where you have to take the followers with you, which is very annoying. But yeah, this single quest requires you to go back and forth not once, not twice, but four times. Just to waste your time and artificially extend the length of the game. The human thinks he has a sense of humor. That was just one of the examples, but the majority of quests are exactly like this. Even those few quests which I actually like have similar problems. Side quests are not excluded and some of them are even a lot worse. For example, there is a side quest that requires you to protect a bunch of orcs from paladins. These orcs don't want to fight anymore and you can choose to help them if you wish. As soon as you accept the quest, you can see a bunch of paladins spawn very close to you out of nowhere. Not once, not twice, but four times. The main quest in Gothic 3 would send you on a journey throughout the whole world. And of course, you could also find a lot of side quests that require you to go from one location to another. But when you get to a new city, you could get a ton of quests that were related to your current location and its vicinity. The game had a very clear direction, unlike Forsaken Gods. This game just likes to make you run around like a headless chicken. There was one main story quest that was so annoying to figure out that I had to google it, I just couldn't take it anymore. Why? Well, this guy gives you some stupid quest you have to do, but when you come back to talk with him again, he disappears. You're supposed to know where he went by reading a single, very vague hint about his location. And again, Gothic 3 would do something similar, but you would get a more straightforward hint. In this particular situation, Gothic 3 would probably tell you that he went in a temple near Trellis. Forsaken Gods tells you that he's close to Trellis or something like that. Besides that, there are a lot more reasons to explore the world in Gothic 3, so you would just stumble upon many different quest objectives by just exploring the world. Forsaken Gods doesn't give you a single strong reason to explore the open world of Murtana again. Most of the main quests are scripted, which is not fundamentally bad, but it makes the game a lot more linear than it should be. Believe it or not, Forsaken Gods had a handful of quests which were pretty interesting. There is a quest where you become a slave for this alchemist and the game takes all of your items. If you need anything like food or water, don't call us. Is that so? This actually depends on what choice you make in a dialogue because I'm pretty sure I could avoid becoming a prisoner. I'm glad I didn't though because this quest becomes a lot deeper and it offers you a couple of different ways to end it. It's surprisingly deep for Forsaken God standards. There was another fun quest where people are going crazy which was kinda fun. But yeah, that would be the only two quests I actually enjoyed in the whole game. To give some credit to Forsaken Gods, I think it was pretty cool to see more scripted events because almost everything in Gothic 3 was completely dynamic. That's exactly what made Gothic 3 so immersive and enjoyable, but I wouldn't mind to see more scripted events, although some of them don't make a lot of sense in Forsaken Gods, like the quest I mentioned before for the paladins you need to rescue. If you come to the place where paladins are hanging out before you take the quest, you won't see the orc who is supposed to guard them. He only shows up after you trigger the quest, which is pretty stupid. That will never happen in Gothic 3. NPCs in all Gothic games would just run to that place from their original location, they would almost never spawn out of nowhere. The main story in Forsaken Gods does have a plot twist I guess, but it's not very good. 
you get a choice or two near the end of the game, but Forsaken Gods only has a one single way to finish it. There is a boss fight at the end and that's it. The boss fight is... Uh, well, I'll show you that very soon in the spoiler section. It's just horrible, there is nothing good about it, trust me. The good thing about the ending is that you can continue playing the game and do all the remaining quests. I don't know why would you want to do that, but hey, it's your choice nonetheless. Oh, and by the way, Forsaken Gods has essential NPCs that can be killed, which is a cardinal sin. That's because pretty much all NPCs in Gothic 3 could be killed from the moment you see them. Even if you killed a very important character, the game would just seamlessly adapt no matter how important that NPC was for the main story. There was an exception to that rule, I guess. You could mess up your game in a way, but not to the point where you can completely break it. At least, I never managed to do that. But for the most part, you could kill whoever you choose if you can handle them in combat. That means that you could actually fail a lot of quests you took, but that usually opens up a new path that you can take. Forsaken Gods has this little menu which is pretty misleading. I only found a single quest that you can fail in the entire game. I assume that could be a couple of more that you can fail, but this doesn't matter at all. It's completely pointless. This game just has a couple of new important NPCs and they have to be essential because it's a linear storyline I guess. I discovered this by attacking this guy on accident. Speaking of that, I think we should move to the spoiler sections and finish the main story discussion. I don't even know why I bother with this, but if you want to play the game for some reason, you might want to skip this by using the timestamp. So no matter what you do, the main story remains the same until the very end. Taurus turns out to be your main target because he's trying to corrupt the Eye of Enos and he captured Milton, your old buddy. Somehow Milton had the Eye of Enos at his possession, but it's not explained how. Okay, your goal is to rescue Milton from the temple outside of Trellis. Taurus plans to summon the most powerful beast from the Eye of Enos with a couple of mages. That beast is the end boss you'll have to kill and it's quite possibly the worst boss fight I had the displeasure to experience in an RPG. To be fair, Piranha Bytes had some really shitty boss fights in their newer games like Elex, but this is just... Uh, well, take a look. <laughs> Yeah, if you went for a melee build, good fucking luck. Oh, and by the way, you don't know the exact location of the beast. There are a couple of different spawn points that you have to check, and of course, all of them are scattered throughout the whole map of Murtana. The beast will always spawn in the Red Oak Cave, and that's pretty much everything you have to know about this. They give you some very bad excuse for this, but it's obvious that it's just another way to waste your time for no reason. After you kill this stupid thing, you go back to Vanguard, and after talking with everyone, you become a new king, Robard III. If you watched my review for Arcania, you know the story begins with Robert III when he apparently lost his mind. I would argue that he lost his mind in Forsaken Gods, but whatever. And it is only right that you, a traitor, Good must God. cease to walk this land of mine. The end. There are so many unexplained things and plot holes, but I'm not even going to bother with this because it's not hard to see how bad the story is. The part about Tyophinos was supposed to be the main plot twist, I guess, but it failed miserably. It doesn't make any sense why would Taurus of all people want to summon this beast and how Milton got Eye of Enos. Zardas is never mentioned again and he doesn't play a role in the main story at all. Even though from the intro cutscene you would think he would get involved somehow because he was supporting Lee for some reason. That was the whole point of your fight. Lee was basically not doing anything and he only had a couple of meaningless dialogue lines. And it's funny how the nameless hero wanted to unite everyone, yet he ends up being very aggressive in the majority of dialogue situations. You could make an argument that this was the beginning of his madness that continues in Arcania, but according to the story of Arcania, that's not how it happens. The main story was so bad that I was struggling to find anything positive about it. Come to think of it, the main story is only a couple of quests in total and everything in between is just busy work. Arcania basically had the same design philosophy, so even though Forsaken Gods and this game were developed by different studios, I'm going to assume that Joe Wood had a lot of influence on the development. Now let's talk about the gameplay. 
To break the monotony, let's talk about some good stuff about the game. Believe it or not, Forsaken Gods has a couple of interesting ideas. The map of Mortana is exactly the same like in Gothic 3, but Forsaken Gods added a couple of things in almost all major locations. It makes exploring the map of Mortana just a little bit different and interesting. These new buildings and houses feel like they were supposed to be in the base game as well. They never felt out of place, so good job with that. In fact, they make the cities of Gothic 3 even more impressive and populated. I also like some little details that Forsaken Gods added, like corpses. However, for every positive thing about this game, you can find at least a couple of negatives. Like I said before, Forsaken Gods only has a handful of NPCs in the whole game that you can actually talk to. The base game of Gothic 3 was much bigger and every location had a ton of interactable NPCs that were related to various quests. That's not the case in Forsaken Gods and the map of Murtana feels really dead and boring because of this, especially in the open world. The amount of content you can find in this expansion doesn't justify the huge land mass of Murtana, there is basically nothing to do. I mean, it's not like Gothic 3 used 99% of the land mass for the content, but it did a much better job when it comes to this, even though it had 3 huge zones in total instead of only one. Forsaken Gods basically removed and destroyed a couple of best features from Gothic 3, reputation system and open-ended gameplay. Removing the reputation system heavily affected the character progression and not in a good way. I know that some people hated the reputation system in Gothic 3, but it was one of the core features of the game. Removing it might seem like a fun idea at first, because without a reputation system, you only need the gold to buy armor sets. But getting gold is not so hard in this expansion, which makes buying armor and weapons less rewarding. You can find a lot of new armor sets and weapons in Forsaken Gods, and visually they look great. I had the same praise for Arcania when it comes to this, which was possibly the only positive thing I said about that game. The lack of reputation system almost completely destroyed the feeling of character progression. I don't see the point of buying mediocre armors in the game, since you can just save a little bit more money and buy the best armor. That wouldn't be a problem if the economy system was done better, but it's not. I'm not saying that it's very easy to get 150k gold, but it's not really that hard either. Although I quickly replaced my expensive armor with the best armor set in the game, which you can get from a specific quest. To be honest, this quest was kinda cool. You need to collect 3 special armor pieces and combine them at the end of the game to get the best armor sets. Although I really don't like when RPGs give you the best armor set at the end of the game, and this is not only related to Forsaken Gods, a lot of RPGs do this. I won't care that much about the best armor if I only get to use it for about 30 minutes and finish the game. By removing the reputation system, you are free to move however you like in all locations, and I think this destroyed another aspect of progression. Upper city design philosophy was present from the very beginning in Gothic games. When it comes to skills, Gothic 3 had trainers all over the world that could teach you different skills and abilities. Very strong and rare skills were usually reserved for just a few NPCs that you could find in specific places on the map. For example, fighting with two weapons or dual wielding can only be taught by Hashishins in the desert. Forsaken Gods try to keep the same idea, but the NPCs who can teach you different skills are randomly scattered through Murtana. I found it a lot more confusing compared to the base game. In order to make populated places a bit more alive, Forsaken Gods added a ton of merchants in the game. Up to the point that merchants and traders are probably the most common NPCs you're going to find in this game. It's definitely useful to have these people at every corner, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. Even though that's the case, every major location feels empty because 95% of NPCs are generic. <laughs> The combat system is completely identical to Gothic 3, nothing really changed. Like I said, the progression system got a lot worse. The feeling of progression in Gothic 3 was one of the major reasons why I could enjoy the gameplay even though the melee combat was pretty bad. It's floaty and clunky as ever and the magic system is still the best way to experience the gameplay. To be fair, the enhanced edition has a much improved AI system which makes the fights a lot better. I'm pretty sure the alternative AI has been included in this version, judging by how NPCs fight. You can't see this option in the menu, but NPCs fight almost identical like in Gothic 3 with this option enabled. It definitely makes the combat a bit better because you'll have to watch out how enemies move and manage your stamina. If you want to fight with melee weapons, you will need to increase your stamina and health. 
Your melee attacks get noticeably slower when your stamina is low, which makes you very vulnerable against stronger NPCs. But yeah, the mechanics are completely identical to the base game. The arena fights are back, and they are pretty much the same like in Gothic 3, which is not a compliment by any means. This was one of the most underdeveloped features in the entire game, and Forsaken Gods didn't do anything to improve it. You only need to fight 3 opponents in all arenas and become the champion. Only this time around you don't get any reputation, so it feels even more pointless than in Gothic 3. The improved AI makes the fights a little bit more fun, but that's pretty much it. Some of the NPCs you're going to fight have some slight visual change, and there is only one brand new enemy type in the entire game. Well, two if you count the end boss, I guess. That new enemy type are troglodytes, and they have a decent visual design. Fighting them is horrible though, they can hit you twice with a single swing. But even attempting to add a new enemy type in this engine is worth some praise, I guess. What's possibly the most disappointing thing when it comes to combat is the lack of big scale fights in the game. In Gothic 3, you could cause a total mayhem and you had these revolutions in cities where all NPCs from different factions would fight each other. Come to think of it, that wouldn't even work in Forsaken Gods because of the essential NPCs. I'm going to assume that you already played Gothic 3 if you watch this video. Or at least you know how the gameplay in Gothic 3 looks, so I'm not going to go in depth about the mechanics. If you want to check out my in-depth thoughts about the gameplay and everything else, make sure to watch my retrospective video about Gothic 3. A lot of people didn't like Gothic 3 because of the floaty melee gameplay. It just lacks the sense of impact and the animations are not so good. Even though Gothic 2 had a weird control scheme and very janky gameplay, the melee combat felt a lot better because of the combo system, and a nice linear progression it had when it comes to learning new skills. I recently made a retrospective video for Reason 1, which was a game that came out a couple of years after Gothic 3. This was probably the best melee combat system that Piranha Bytes ever made. It was not amazing by any means, and it had some problems, but it was a step in the right direction. It's a lot closer to the idea of combat from Gothic 1 and 2 than Gothic 3. Piranha Bytes is not responsible for Forsaken Gods, but the studios that Joe Wood hired didn't make a single change about the combat in general. Well, actually, that might be a lie. There is a very bad dodge move that you can perform, and I'm not sure if this is from the patch or from the original game. It can be useful sometimes, but it has a very stiff animation and it doesn't feel good to use. To be fair, even in this crappy state it was probably not easy to implement, so props for the effort, I guess. The community patches for Gothic 3 removed the option to pause the game while using the inventory. And another patch allows you to use consumables while running, so this is a good way to balance out the gameplay. Forsaken Gods doesn't have anything like this, the game still pauses if you open up your inventory, which almost completely eliminates any threat of dying. To sum it up, if you didn't like the gameplay in Gothic 3, you're not going to like this as well. Actually, you're probably going to hate it even more. I don't know what you're talking about, so I'm gonna take my leave now. It's sad because this was a chance to make the best version of Gothic 3 combats. I recently made a video about Gothic 3 where I talked about some features that aged pretty well in my opinion. The visuals was one of those topics. Just like the base game of Gothic 3, this expansion holds up pretty well in terms of visuals. Even though Forsaken Gods came out in 2008, the base game came out in 2006 and it had the same visuals. The Mortana region still looks amazing for its age, it's my favorite forest area in a game, like, ever. Whenever I come back to Gothic 3, I'm always amazed by the environment and how much detail Piranha Bytes managed to cram in these locations. Every plant has a unique 3D model, the ground clutter is very detailed and varied, as well as the trees. But let's get this straight, Forsaken Gods have nothing to do with this, because the region of Mortana is pretty much identical in this expansion. The horrible performance will not allow you to appreciate the visual design of this game though, and like I said, the base game of Gothic 3 is not suffering from these issues anymore. So I highly recommend playing Gothic 3 over this, especially if you never got the chance to play it in the past. Human character models never look that great, and this is definitely the worst part about the visuals. Apart from a couple of very unique looking character models, everyone else looked very similar and not memorable at all. Forsaken Gods added a nice little graphical effect on metal surfaces. Swords and armor look shiny, which is a nice little touch. Gothic 3 engine has a full day and night cycle, which is not only affecting the visuals, but the NPC behavior as well. But unlike in Gothic 3, you won't get to appreciate this in Forsaken Gods, since most NPCs are generic and nothing is happening in the game. That's pretty much it when it comes to graphics, I guess. Gothic 3 has a timeless art style, if you ask me. 
we came to the best part about this entire game and it has nothing to do with the expansion. The music is copy and pasted obviously and it's my most favorite soundtrack ever. Although it's not complete in Forsaken Gods because you only get to explore Mortana. Soundtracks are different depending on the region in Gothic 3. But Mortana has the most recognizable soundtrack in the game, Vista Points. Even if you don't plan to play Gothic 3, I highly recommend listening to this soundtrack in your spare time. I use it to write scripts for my videos and when I want to relax. The voice acting is absolutely terrible for the most part. <laughs> you are quite an eager slave. What? Sure, Gothic 3 had some pretty bad voice acting as well, but it was mediocre for the most part. Leave me alone. The orcs in Gothic 3 had an amazing voice acting actually. What goods are you waiting for? Three large packages with my name on them! Big, sturdy wooden crates! I'll make the necessary arrangements to put a stop to it. Good work. Carry on. So, what the hell happened with Torx voice actors in Forsaken Gods? Do you know anything about the mages who have allied with Thoris? They are not important. The orcs will win the war. Putting that aside, the nameless hero has the most annoying voice acting in the entire game. It's obviously not the same voice actor from Gothic 3. He's not the worst, but he's definitely the most annoying, because he always sounds like he's rehearsing a play or something. I can't stand him. Mertana is in need of good people. Soon it will need a man of your intelligence to bring it back to the way it used to be. Should you change your ways, look for me. If you don't, I will be looking for you. When it comes to sound effects, it's the same story like in Gothic 3, but you guessed it, it gets even worse. There are only a handful of new sound effects in the expansion, mainly for troglodytes and the last boss. They make some really annoying noises. <laughs> Everything else is the same like in Gothic 3, which means that it's not very good. Joe would hire some very inexperienced people to work on this expansion. It just shows you how much talent the people from a small studio need to have in order to produce a decent open world RPG, especially back then. Forsaken Gods will always be a black ship in this franchise along with Arcania, even though Arcania doesn't bear the name of Gothic game anymore. The unfinished state of Gothic 3 was already a nail in the coffin for this franchise and Forsaken Gods just brought the rest of the nails I guess. People who developed it clearly had no idea what makes Gothic games so beloved. Sure, Gothic 3 was very different compared to previous games in this franchise and a lot of fans didn't like it, not just because it was clearly unfinished. But Forsaken Gods feels like something that was never supposed to exist, let alone bear the same name like the Gothic trilogy. I would never recommend this game to anyone, but if you're crazy enough to try it out because you're bored or something, you can use my GOG link and support the channel. My previous retrospective videos also have these links, so if you decide to buy them on GOG, using my links would be much appreciated. But watching the video and subscribing is still the best way to support the channel though. If you wanna go a step further, you can always become a Patreon or a YouTube member. Even the smallest support means a lot. That'll be all, and I'll see you in the next one.